Act One, The Hammer of the King. Clang, clang, clang. The smashing of Abdullahad's blacksmith hammer echoed like the seismic clap of a thunderbolt dancing on the horizon. This particular blacksmith hammer had been passed down from generation to generation. The handle was bound in an ancient black leather and scarred by the relentless bombardment of toil. A toil Abdullahad was becoming all too familiar with. Sparks flung from the anvil and splashed over the anvil like embers carelessly tossed from a fire pit. Abdullahad momentarily paused his brawny barrage on the anvil to lament the oncoming winter. The Panchir Valley was impassable by the middle of winter, locking in the residents to shelter in place for months on end. Lately, Abdullahad's thoughts drifted, setting sail in his mind a voyage beyond the endless mounds of the Panchir Valley. At the basin of the valley lay a secluded village. For seven generations, Abdullahad's family had called that village home. Is it supper time already? Forgive me, father. My mind was a wander. Azim obligingly outstretched his right hand, gesturing his reluctant son to relinquish the blacksmith hammer. He flipped the hallowed hammer and tilted the hefty handle in the direction of his foreboding father. Time cleansed the hammer of any distinguishable markings that once may have existed. Azim gripped the hammer with a renewed sense of vigor and ran his thumb down the shaft of the handle, stopping at the base. Believe it or not, your grandfather and I used to speak of similar grandeur. The world beckoned to him, as it does you. But our place is here, my son. Like this anvil, we are anchored to this land, Azim said, while gently striking the anvil with the palm of his hulking hand. As Azim finished speaking, the sun began to set behind his sinewy shoulders. A striking shadow loomed over the hut and crept into the room. The humid valley had tarnished his salubrious skin, darkening the hue to a crisp golden brown. His wavy white hair wafted in the southerly breeze like the tattered blades of love grass scattered along the riverbed of the valley. Azim's facial hair was as white as a cow's breath beneath the morning mist. I know, father. And yet, some undisguisable urge calls on you. A girl, perhaps. Father, I wish I knew. My mind wanders like leaves fall from a tree in autumn, Abdullahad said while staring at the imperfections in the sublime family heirloom. Time had worn away the once pristine anvil, whittling away the custom engravings. The once prominent markings now faintly resembled factious words, no more distinguishable than inscriptions on an ancient sarcophagus. Scars embedded deep into the anvil, like the superficial wounds on a battle-tested shield. Your grandfather once told me that a man's destiny is not described at birth. Your destiny can be shaped as easily as we use the hammer to bend a piece of iron. It has been many winters since your grandfather passed his hammer down to me. In two more winters, I will be ready to pass it down to you. Then you can shape your own destiny. If it is your will to leave the village, then I will respect your decision. But not until then. Your family needs you. Abdullahad breathed deeply and silently as his benevolent father examined the hammer. Azim started patting the head of the blacksmith hammer with his palm and asked his son, Have I ever told you the origins of this hammer? Abdullahad nodded and answered, Father, you weaned me on that story. I must have heard it over a thousand times. Azim smirked at his son's newfound candidness and cavalier attitude. He gently placed the hammer down on the anvil, like a widow laying a bouquet of flowers at the head of a tombstone. One more time won't kill you then. H-O-T-K was inscribed into the handle of this hammer. Right here. The king himself, King Darius, wrote the inscription into the handle. 
he wrote that inscription. Azim perspicaciously paused for a moment to articulate his tedious thoughts. He wrote that inscription to honor the hard work and dedication of our great-grandfather, to honor... Abdul paused for a moment to let his father reclaim his train of thought. As of late, Azim had found storytelling a tortuous task. Azim smiled at his firstborn son and said, To honor our craftsmanship, to honor our family, to honor our heritage. This hammer is not just a hammer. This hammer is a symbol of our stewardship. We owe this land, our land, to our king and to our hard work. Azim picked up the blacksmith hammer and started to walk around the workshop. He placed the hammer down on one of the workbenches next to the only window in the room. The workshop was attached to the hut and no larger than a barn. As he walked out of the workshop, he paused to pat his son on the shoulder. It was the kind of firm, reassuring pat on the back that only a son could truly appreciate. An hour passed, and then another. As Abdullah had glanced out of the window, the sun began to slowly lower behind the apex of the mound. It was at that very moment, as the sun set, Abdullah had felt the renewed urge to chase the fleeting beams on the horizon. He sprang up from his workbench and set forth, like bees humming mindlessly back to a hive. He brushed across a broom and oafishly stumbled through the doorway, knocking down a few accoutrements in his path. A large, shadowy outline of a man cascaded over Abdul Ahad. Where are you off to in such a hurry? Azim asked his son, in the kind of stern tone of voice that straightened his spine. I... Before he could finish blurting out his response, Abdul Ahad's mother gracefully crept into the workshop. This was a territory of the home she rarely ever ventured. He is running away, just like his father did so many years ago. In fact, isn't that how we met? Azim tilted his head slightly and folded his arms in a stubborn form of protest. His forearms swelled as they pressed up against the lower parts of his chest. Raila, his place is here. Next winter he will be a man. He must leave these childish aspirations behind. Raila delicately placed her left hand on the back of Azim's shoulder and began to gently massage his backside. The years of pounding away on the anvil left a lasting mark on Azim's body. His shoulders were left swollen, yet withered, his back rounded, yet brittle, his neck girthy, yet encapsulated with sun-damaged scars. Husband, the sun will set on the horizon. But the anvil will be right here when he returns home, she said while snugly embracing her husband. Father, I won't be long. I swear it. Azim swatted the supple hand of his slender wife and quickly rose from his chair. He walked over to his crestfallen son and picked him from the ground. He placed his hand on the cheek of his son and began to slowly nod. Go on, my son. Azim said begrudgingly to his exuberant son. Azim breathed a heavy sigh of relief to know his son was finally growing up to be a man. His youthful jubilance restored the old man's sensibility and zest for life. Abdul's eyebrows arched higher than the crests of the tallest mounds along the valley. He beamed a smile and hugged his father. As he turned and ran out the door, his father interrupted him by saying, Be back before darkness falls. I will, father. Abdullahad ran faster than a rabbit scurrying away from a hungry mountain lion. As he scaled the mound overlooking the village, his home became nothing more than a distant memory. He eagerly explored the land, like an archaeologist investigating an ancient undiscovered tribal burial ground. Abdullah had looked around the mound and spotted a clearing down by the riverbed. As he rushed down the backside of the mound, the valley darkened and the shadows of the forest soaked the ground. His breathing hastened to a rabid pace, 
like a fish out of water, gasping for air. His eyes began to gloss over. His mind was willing, but his body forced him down to a snail's crawl. Abdul took a moment to refocus himself and recenter his mind's eye. This might be a good place to take a rest, he said aloud to an empty field. Abdullah had planted his hands firmly on his hips and began to slowly recover his breathing. His racing heartbeat began to level off. Before he knew it, the valley was swallowed by total darkness. Abdullah had noticed the fading sunlight, but was intent to soak up every second of his adventure. A distant thump pulled Abdul out of his momentary trance. It was a faint sound, at first barely recognizable or discernible from ambient noise in the valley. Abdul thought very little of it at first. Again, the tremble of another thump terrorized his ears. Abdul turned his head to the source of the sound. It was the other side of the mound. Thump, thump, thump. The tantalizing thumping grew in severity and frequency, but Abdul could not make heads or tails of the noise. I'm not fond of sleeping in the forest. Might be the time to head back home, he said aloud to an empty forest. Thump, thump. Thump. The eminence of the thumping escalated in severity as Abdul climbed the mound. Abdullah had distraughtly shook his head in a moment of pure confusion. The source of the noise eluded him, like an apprentice to the apothecary deciphering a recipe written in Latin. Abdul slowly trudged up the backside of the mound and made his way back to the village. Before ascending the crest of the mound, he sucked a scent of smoke into his nasal passage. Abdul shook his head and scampered on the top of the mound. As he stood on the top of the mound, the color drained from Abdul's face. His beatific bronze skin turned as white as the winter snowstorm. No. Abdul's knees buckled and he fell to the ground. His village was set ablaze like a wildfire ripping through a field of rye. The walls of the huts crumbled to the ground, falling like limbs from a rotting cypress tree. Abdul's heart started pounding. His blood began to boil. His veins pulsated with pure rage. He ran down the mound with the ferocity of a stampeding pack of bulls. Hut after hut was scorched. He ran to his home with flagrant disregard for his own life. Embers smacked him in the face. Poignant plumes of pernicious smoke pranced around him. His furious pace was halted by an unbearable, opulent odor. Tears careened down his eyes like the flow of water down a river, obscuring his vision, but heightening his other senses. Abdul planted his knees deep into the soil in front of his home. For all that remained of his beloved home was his anvil. Clang, clang, clang. Abdul swiveled his head in the direction of the melancholic noise. He hastily jumped up from the ground and dashed towards the direction of the noise. The familiar sound of his blacksmith's hammer cleansed the tears from his eyes. The smoke draped over the remnants of the village like the black shroud over the face of a widow at her husband's funeral service. My hammer, he said under his breath. The steam protruded from his mouth, like smoke out of a chimera's nostrils. Abdullah had started fervently searching around for the source of the sound. For a moment, his mind tricked him into thinking this was all merely just a dream. For a moment, his naive mind lulled him into a false sense of security. For a moment, he was foolish enough to hope. Then in a moment, he realized the nightmare had just begun. Three large men were surrounding a campfire outside of the nearest charred hut. One of the men was slamming Abdul's hammer against the rock. He struggled to slam the hammer with any meaningful force. The balance of a blacksmith's hammer was far different from that of a sword. The other two men chuckled at their comrade's incompetence. Without a moment's compunction, 
Abdullahad roared a deafening shriek at the top of his lungs and sprang towards the groggy trio. Two of the men crookedly stumbled around the campfire. The man feebly attempted to swing the hammer, but Abdul rushed him and tackled him into the campfire. Abdul and the man rolled around the campfire, kicking and screaming like two out-of-control hyenas. The larger man tossed Abdul off and stumbled back up to his feet. He slowly unsheathed his sword, with the two other men looking onward in a drunken stupor. Each of the men barely able to keep standing, swaying in the wind like blades of grass caught in a breeze. The man stomped on Abdul's right arm and raised his sword high into the air. Abdul looked to his left and saw his hammer covered in dirt. In one fell swoop he snagged the hammer and swung it with the force of all his ancestors. In one swooping motion, the hammer detached the lower extremity clean off the man's kneecap. The man dropped his sword to the ground and screamed at the top of his lungs. After hobbling on a single leg, he fell sideways onto the campfire. Abdul jumped to his feet and slammed the hammer down on the man, peppering his body with blows from the hammer. The two men forcefully exchanged screams. The onlookers were unable to decipher who was screaming louder. Abdullahad pulverized what was left of the man's corpse. Chunks of bone flung around the campfire, like a butcher pounding a bunch of ground beef with a mallet. Abdullahad picked himself up from the torrid, blood-soaked ground. His veins throbbed with an acute burst of adrenaline. His anger subsided as he turned his focus on the other two men. His eyes myopically focused on the other two men trained on them like a hungry hawk staring down a rabbit. He avulsed the hammer from the Sasanian corpse and pointed it at the other two men. They each stood about ten feet away from Abdul, their haggard hands cloistered on the hilts of their scummy swords. Chunks of their dead comrade drooped off the hammer's face and slipped into the embers of the campfire. Abdul's fully outstretched arm did not waver, not an inch. It was not muscle that raised up that hammer. Rage had raised up that hammer. Vengeance had raised up that hammer. Justice had raised up that hammer. Abdul slowly lowered the hammer and shrieked at the top of his lungs. The steam from his breath fumed out of his mouth like the pyroclastic blast of a volcanic eruption. His gallant grip tightened around the handle of the blacksmith hammer. The skin around his knuckles turned pale white, and his face swelled red with blood. He lunged towards the men, and without a moment's hesitation, they fled like cowards into the hills. Abdullahad's mouth dripped with a cocktail of blood, saliva, and adrenaline. His eyes swirled as he pathetically plunged to the ground tumbling as hard as a sack of potatoes tossed from a carriage. On the next day, the sun slowly rose over the mound and blanketed the belly of the valley. Abdullahad's eyes were severely swollen and profanely puffy. His eyelids crept open like a drunkard awakening from a halcyon hangover. He instinctively raised his hand up to block the bothersome beams of the sunlight. Abdullahad lingered on the ground, not wanting to accept the reality of what transpired the night before. The soil was as madisant as Amazonian quicksand. His mind urged him to get up, but alas, his body was unwilling. The smoke from the fire had subsided, and all that remained of his village were piles of ash and settee. Abdullahad carelessly dropped his hand and stared at the sun, with a shameful disregard for his own well-being. As he lay there, baking in the sun, a faint squishing sound approached him from behind. Abdullahad didn't so much as flinch. Part of him eagerly invited in the danger to alleviate his endless sorrow. A large shadow carelessly crept over his body. The shadowy figure blotted out the sun from overhead. The foreign man was slender, yet oddly bulky in the upper torso. Um, 
am I dead? The mysterious man scoffed and said, Dead? No, you're not dead. Fortunately for you, the crows have been feasting on your friend over there. Are you going to kill me? Abdullah had pathetically asked the cumbrous stranger. Kill you? Quite the contrary. By the looks of it, we will need every man we can get our hands on. Abdullah had raised his hand to shade his eyeballs from the immense glare of the sunlight. He hoped to get a better look at the swarthy stranger standing over him. As he raised his hand up, the stranger grabbed on and plucked Abdullah had from the ground. He plucked him as easily as a farmer plucking a potato from the soil. Abdullah had belched out a reluctant, irritated gasp. The man flung him over his shoulder and tossed him onto a camel like a fishmonger tossing a fish into an icebox. The man pulled out a blanket from his saddlebag and clandestinely covered the young blacksmith. The albino camel plopped down on all fours and waited for the stranger to give a command. The stranger took a second to go inspect the rotting corpse of the vanquished warrior. His corpse was roasted, dangling by the campfire and bludgeoned beyond recognition. He closely examined the antiquated armor, the various pieces of cloth scattered around the campfire, and some of the abhorrent armaments. I've seen these markings before, so it's true then. Sasanians, he said while frolicking around the campfire. Thump, thump, thump. A distant thumping immediately alerted the old man into a frenzy, like a dog perking up after a car alarm. He sprang up from the ground and began to scan the devastated campsite for any other survivors. The man placed his fingers between his lips and erupted a loud whistle. Jamal, the stranger shouted to his camel. The camel acquiesced to the command and jolted up from the ground. The man firmly grabbed the reins and swiftly swung over the side of the camel. We've overstayed our welcome. Hold on he said to Abdullah had while kicking the sides of the camel with his heels. The camel dashed out of the village with a blinding speed, leaving nothing more than a dust cloud in its wake. Abdullah had was helpless. He could only look on, drained of life. As the camel sped off with the two men, Abdullah had could only see his village slip away into the distance. Dust scattered around the entrails of the camel like an out-of-control swarm of bees hovering around a beehive. After about an hour of riding, the camel downshifted to a moderate gallop. Abdullah had had began to regain his senses and properly asserted himself on the backside of the camel. My name is Ahmed Fahad. I'm famous around these parts. Abdullah had. Abdullah had. Good to make your acquaintance. This is Jamal, my trusted steed. We have been to the edge of the earth and back. He saved my life more times than I can care to remember. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Can I ask, where might we be going? Ahmed said confidently, We are headed to the royal palace. There is a goat path that leads up the mountain. It is not known to many. Abdullah shook his head at the proclamation and began to laugh at the man. Ahmed looked back with a displeased gaze. Most would be grateful to meet the wise, the all-knowing King Khan, let alone be rescued by the world-famous Ahmed Fahad. Rescued? You didn't think they were going to let you best their man without coming back for revenge, did you? Sasanians don't take kindly to that sort of thing. Sasanians never travel alone, and they always remember. The thumping. Yes, the thumping. Sasanian war drums. And based on how you hoisted their friend like a skewered piece of kebab, you didn't make too many allies last night. Sasanians. Hmm. They come from the Far East. They roam from country to country pillaging and plundering whatever they can get their grubby hands on. And now, they are here in Afghanistan. 
The camel's pace lessened to a brisk stroll as it led the men up the trail to the palace. The palace was highly guarded and braced against the back of a mountain. Now when we get in there, let me do all the talking. Understand, Abdullah had? By all means. It's not every day that I get rescued by the famous Ahmed Fahad, Abdullah had said in jest to his new companion. As the pair rode up the narrow path to the palace, the time passed as fast as leaves falling off a cherry blossom tree in the dead of winter. Before the men knew it, their banter was interrupted by powerful treble. Who goes there? A guardsman yelled from behind the gate with a stentorian voice. The voice of the guardsman carried well beyond the boundaries of the palace and lathered the exterior courtyard surrounding the palace walls. The walls of the palace were almost as high as the cypress trees and other arboreous species that littered the mouth of the valley. The walls of the palace were varnished pine wood, soaked over years in black paint. Abdullah had dismounted from the camel and began to approach the gates of the palace. Before he could utter a word, his compatriot gleefully introduced himself. I am Ahmed Fahad, son of Muhammad ibn Fahad, grandson of the great Yawar Abi, the famous Ahmed Fahad. The guardsmen both stared at Ahmed with a high degree of lugubrious ambivalence. One of the guardsmen pointed to Abdullah and asked, And the boy, is he famous too? Ahmed Fahad dismounted his camel and said, This is Abdullah Had, son of Azim, grandson of Yuriz. And this is Jamal, my trusty steed. What is your business at the palace? We must speak to the king at once. Sassanians are invading. Act Two The Attestation of King Futuhan. Ahmed and Abdullah had carefully crept into the royal throne room of the palace. The throne room was teeming with ambient noise from the ensemble of royal abettors. Blackened crimson curtains draped over the towering walls of the palace. The king's guardsmen grabbed Ahmed and Abdullah had from behind and jostled the two men forward towards the throne. The guardsmen towered over the two men. He stood just shy of seven feet tall. The king sat upon the throne, perturbed by the onslaught of bad news from his subjects. His brow adorned a crown suited only for a king, a crown built of the lamentation of his people. Story after story, the king was subjected to ghastly tales of terror. The guardsman lazily loosened his stalwart grip and momentarily emancipated the two men, like a fisherman dehooking the catch of the day. He nudged the men closer to the throne and shouted, All hail King Futuhan! Ahmed whispered under his breath to his compatriot, Bow your head and remember, let me do all the talking. Abdullah had acquiesced to the sensible advice by slowly lowering down his head. As Abdullah had lowered his head, he turned his gaze over to his self-assured companion. Ahmed gracefully lowered his waistline and showed his respect to the king. Ahmed bounced back up with the springiness of a kangaroo. As Ahmed elevated his chin, he purposefully locked eyes with the budding king. I am Ahmed Fahad, son of Muhammad ibn Fahad, grandson of the great. The dapper king dismissed Ahmed with a swift cumber flick of the wrist. His whimsical wrist waved like wind chimes swaying in the summer breeze. The guardsman resumed his diligent duties by pulling back Ahmed into the backdrop of the room. Simultaneously, the guardsman shoved Abdullah closer to the throne. The guardsman murmured under his breath the deep reverberating growl that echoed throughout the throne room. Mm. So, my guardsman here tells me you bested a Sasanian in single combat. Quite impressive. Abdullah legs joggled with anxiety, and he said, If that is what he was. I did not know at the time, your majesty. Modest too. How modest indeed, the king said while looking over to his entourage of agreeable advisors. 
The advisors were slender elder men of noble stature. Each man wore a dark robe that drooped to the floor. The king was young, but kept confidence in his elder tribesmen. From birth, these men were handpicked to advise the palace in various dealings. These men were renowned in the deadly art of politics, an art that Abdullah had, son of a blacksmith, knew very little. Your Majesty, not only did he best the Sasanian in single combat. The king met Ahmed's interruption with a slight downward nod of the head and an upward raise of the eyebrow. His bushy, dark brown eyebrows were elevated higher than the mounds surrounding Abdullahad's village. The king's murky complexion was amplified by the wholesome radiance of the young man standing in front of him. The guardsman inched closer to the indefatigable Ahmed Fahad and growled under his breath once more. Mm. The guttural growl of the guard left a lasting linger with Ahmed, leaving an ineffable resonance on his imagination. Ahmed hastily abandoned his grandstanding for the time being. Apparently, he wasn't as famous as the king. The guard's rotund belly acted as a barrier between the king and his audience goers. The refined curvature of the guard's belly resembled almost that of a pregnant woman. The hair from the man's forearms curled around his swollen forearms, like a form of natural cloth armor. His long black hair draped over his massive shoulders. Now, tell me in your own words what happened. Do not fret formality here, Abdullah Had, son of Azim, grandson of Yoris. I... I went to go explore the mountains around our village. All of a sudden, there was a chaotic thumping sound, and by the time I got back, Abdullah Had said while staring at the pristine floor of the throne room. The king made a hand gesture, beckoning for Abdullah Had to continue his tale of terror. One of the royal servants ascended the steps of the throne and presented a silver tray of delicacies. The king patiently perused the assortment of treats, scanning over the edibles with his hand. Abdullah Had was petrified with anxiety as the king nonchalantly browsed through the magnificent morsels. The king grinned at the sight of a fresh bowl of vine-ripened olives. He plucked the green olives from the bowl and flicked them into his mouth. One by one, he spat out the pits of the olive into a bowl. He resumed his prior hand gesture, inviting Abdullah to continue on with his story. My village was burned to the ground. These men, these monsters, they... Abdullah forehead pulsated with blood, his face swelled with vitriolic anger. The veins on his forehead throbbed uncontrollably and spasmed like the stomach muscles of an Egyptian belly dancer. The king took notice of the sudden change in disposition. He placed the bowl of olives down, gently back on the silver tray, and began to wipe his hands with a crimson napkin. He curtly invited the young man to continue. And then... Your Majesty, they burned my village down to ashes. My home, my family, my everything he said while clutching his balled-up hand. Who is they? King Fatah Khan asked with great interest. I found the three men responsible. And? I lost control of myself. I charged the men and was able to knock one to the ground. In the kerfuffle, I was lucky enough to wrestle away my blacksmith's hammer and instinct took over from there. Yes, the instinct of a true warrior. An Afghan warrior, Ahmed said while walking around the throne room, boasting on behalf of his brethren. Ahmed jumped up on an empty chair and yelled to the crowd of nobles. Abdullah had single-handedly defeated a Sasanian. As for the other two Sasanian dogs, they fled into the hills like cowards. The king reluctantly stood up from his throne and looked out of the nearest window. He pulled the curtain from the window and stared aimlessly into the valley. The view of the palace could see the better part of the valley and the voluptuous curvature of his land. So the reports were true. If they could make it this far north, all the way to the mouth of the Panchir Valley, 
then they could just march up to our very doorstep. The king began to stroke his callow chin while pondering his options. All the while, his congregation of bureaucratic nobility whispered rumors of war. In Afghanistan, the longer the beard, the darker the beard, meant the greater the nobility. The throne room of the palace was congested with bearded elders vying for position, all yearning for a spot at the table, all eager to curry favor with the king, for war meant an opportunity to galvanize one standing in history. Moments turned into minutes, minutes into an eternity. The king clasped his hands behind the swell of his back and said, War! All available men to arms! Spread the word to every village. Any man who can wield a weapon, any boy capable, we fight. The king's assembly started shouting in obnoxious anticipation for the looming war. The slender bureaucrats scurried around the courtyard, like the unknowing rats on a sinking ship. Ahmed looked on at the senseless display of bravado from the various tribal leaders in attendance. For Ahmad knew all too well the true cost of war, because he had paid it too many times before. Abdullahad looked over at his unflappable companion, as a new look of dread turned him quite lugubrious. Ahmad began to pull his sleeves down to cover up his many calloused battle scars. Jagged cracks of discolored soft tissue covered his arms. He escorted his companion out of the throne room to the courtyard of the palace. Abdullahad made quick haste as he approached the gates of the palace. The frenzied audience goers clamored and flocked out of the palace, like a gaggle of geese scattering to the wind. One of the more discreet bureaucrats navigated through the crowd and meandered over to Ahmed. Ahmed Fahad? he asked with an unabashed tone of voice. Ahmed curtsied to the man and asked, How may I be of service? Captain Ahmed Fahad? Ahmed stood stoically as he sized up the brutish bureaucrat. Ahmed learned long ago, politics was not his strong suit. The same captain that famously fended off the Macedonian siege of Kobal? That was a long time ago. Indeed, but nonetheless, the kingdom requires your leadership once more. Do you answer the call? I gave that life up. The bureaucrat scoffed and said, I am well aware of your accolades. We need your sword. We need your leadership. We need the famous Ahmed Fahad on the battlefield. Then you are also well aware that I am no longer a captain. Would you like to change that? Ahmed Fahad slowly inhaled the breath of the dry Afghan air. He folded his arms as he mulled over the politician's promising proposition. I answer the call he said while extending his hand to the bureaucrat. The two men shook hands before parting ways. Ahmed followed his young companion into the bowels of the courtyard, heading toward the abounding gates of the palace. Abdullahad, your king calls on you to fight. Do you answer the call? I am no fighter. I am just a humble blacksmith. It is not my destiny, nor my place. Ahmed scoffed and continued his protestation of his newfound companion. A mere blacksmith. A blacksmith who bested a Sasanian in armed combat, wielding nothing more than a hammer? No, son, you are no mere anything. You are a true warrior. I can feel it. I would bet my life on it. Ahmed began to strap the saddlebag across the hump of his camel. The leather of the saddlebag made a slapping sound as it bound to the camel. The bag took two hands to swing, and if not quickly secured, often slid off the hump. If not to battle, where will you go? Abdullahad squirmed at the excoriating excruciation of the simpleton's question. I... I will go home. It is where I belong, he pouted proudly. Home! Where is home, exactly? Last time I checked, home is long gone. I will rebuild. I... 
Abdullahad said while his eyes uncontrollably began to water, like tears in the rain. Abdullahad, the blacksmith. Yes, and what is so wrong with being a blacksmith? Nothing at all, but you are not just a blacksmith. Maybe, but I am surely not a warrior. There is a warrior in all of us, boy. There is a tempest in you, boy. I can feel it in my bones. Abdullahad shook his ignoble crown and said, There, there is nothing in me. Nothing but regret. Regret? If I was only there. If only. You'd be dead too. Now, alive, here, you can make a difference. Abdullahad gulped and tilted his head up towards the sky. A single tear rolled down his cheek as he continued packing. Don't do it for the king. Don't do it for me. Don't do it for your country. Do it for your family. You owe them that much. So says the great Ahmed Fahad. I can teach you sword skills. I can teach you combat. What cannot be taught is that thing deep down inside of you. That vengeance, that rage, that power. You fight without fear. You fight for a higher calling. The heart of a true warrior is in you. Do you even know why you bested the Sasanian? Have you even asked yourself? Abdul stopped dead in his tracks. He looked over his shoulder and said, He was drunk, and I was lucky. Drunk? Maybe he was. He stunk something awful when I found you. When you charged at him, his spirit crumbled like a wet piece of parchment paper. When you charge at a man, you expose his inner warrior spirit. If the spirit is weak, they flee. What you have inside you, that cannot be learned. It can only be unleashed. That makes you a dangerous man. I cannot. Ahmed sighed and said, we are born with our destiny ascribed to us at birth. From our first breath it is chosen. Sometimes we are destined for a path that we must walk alone. If I cannot convince you to serve your country, then at least come to the new recruit training tomorrow. The men could learn from your story. It could inspire them to do something brave. What they learn from your story might save a life. Abdullahad looked at Ahmed and nodded in agreement. Act 3. For King and Country Today we will teach you the art of war. The Sasanians are fast, strong, and large in numbers. They are in your land. They are in your home. They are pillaging your future. The one thing they don't have is this. Ahmed Fahad grabbed the chest plate of the smallest recruit on the front line and slammed his fist into the heart of his breastplate. The heart of a lion. You are a lion. We are lions. We are fewer in numbers, yes, but our spirit shall never die. Even in death, you may live forever. The king called all fighting age men to the front lines of the war. Men of noble stature, common men, bakers, farmers. Today, they would all become warriors. The front row of recruits stood tall and proud, for they knew nothing of the war to come. Most of these men only learned of battle from bedtime stories. Ahmed looked up and down at the men as he removed his scarf from his neck. He slowly unraveled the scarf, revealing a jagged scar the shape of lightning bolt. We have seen their kind before. I have met their kind on the battlefield. Many nations have tried to conquer our land. All that have tried have failed. Ophish Akkadians, gleeful Greeks, monstrous Mongols. But they all had one thing in common. One distinct disadvantage. The men gazed on at the courageous captain with a curious disposition. Abdullahad, front and center. 
Abdul made his way to the front of the courtyard where the men were training. As he passed the first couple of rows, the recruits whispered among themselves. Ahmad made sure to spread rumors of his brawl with the Sasanian. This man single-handedly crushed in the skull of a Sasanian mercenary. I found the boy dining with his corpse. The Sasanian was near ten feet tall and well over three hundred pounds. With nothing more than his bare hands and his blacksmith hammer. This man has the heart of a lion. Today we will find out if that can be said about the rest of you. The largest man in the courtyard stood up from the makeshift stool he made out of a wine keg. He towered over the other men and pushed his way to the front of the line. If this man killed one Sasanian, then send me to fight the entire army. The recruits bellowed with nervous laughter. Ahmed smiled and looked up at the men. Ahmed's forehead met the better part of the man's chin. And what is your name, recruit? I am Kassar. How about we start with a test of strength? Kassar scrunched his brow and started bursting out in laughter. Lead the way, old man. See that brass container? Ahmed asked the young mountain of a man while pointing over the corner of the courtyard. Kassar slanted his head to the side and stared at the rotund brass keg. Abdullahad looked from afar. His eagerness for revenge was only toppled by his love for competition. He slowly crept closer, making sure to stay unnoticed. What about it? Kassar asked. Whomever can move this keg will be first in line for a promotion. Let's say from one end of the courtyard to the other. Sounds simple enough? Kassar laughed at the challenge and said, The first? If anyone else touches the keg, I shall squash them like a bug. Stand back. Kassar moved up to the keg, like Sisyphus preparing to push a boulder up a hill. Unfortunately for Kassar, he had about the same amount of luck as Sisyphus pushing that boulder up that hill. Kassar hugged the keg and quaked as he attempted to wrangle it. As hard as he tried, the keg did not move. As much as he ached, the keg did not move. As much as he fought, the keg fought back harder. The veins in Kassar's head pulsated like raging rivers after the melting of a snowpack. Ahmed shouted, Kassar, what are you waiting for? Your man is counting on you for this keg. Push yourself. Kassar's face turned redder than a perfectly ripened cherry tomato. Kassar huffed and puffed to no avail. After a few minutes, he loosened his grip from keg and retreated to the center of the courtyard. Kassar stood in the center of the courtyard and bellowed with laughter. Well, if I cannot do it, no man in this room can. Don't even bother. Is he right? Can no man here move this keg? Am I to believe there is not a single man among you with the ability to move this keg? The recruits looked to their sides and waited for a peer to step up. After a few seconds, Ahmed asked, No one! From the back of the courtyard, a soft voice spoke. I will. A tiny man stepped into the forefront of the group. He flowed through the group like water around a polished stone. Ah, and what, pray tell, is your name? I am Nasir. Step right up, Nasir. Show us what you got. This'll be quick, Kassar shouted. Nasir started knocking on the keg, searching for a chink in the armor. The knocks reverberated throughout the courtyard. He shook his head and said, Simple. He twisted off the lid of the keg and yanked down as hard as he could. The keg toppled over, spilling the water into the courtyard. The waves crashed along the feet of the soon-to-be soldiers. He kicked up his foot onto the keg and rolled it over to the end of the courtyard. Nasser smiled while backing away from the keg. He bowed with his arms extended, like the curtsy of a ballerina. Clap, clap, clap. 
Look at that ingenuity. You could all learn a lesson from Nasser. A lesson as to what not to do. Nasser looked back at Ahmed with confusion. He planted his hands firmly on his hips and questioned his captain. I moved the keg, just like you asked. You did. You moved the keg. And in a rather clever way, I might add. However, that keg had your men's entire water supply for the journey through the desert. Now you are all dead. Congratulations. Nasser's smirk quickly whittled away as the captain spoke those somber words of encouragement. Back of the line, soldier. What was the point of the exercise? Can someone enlighten me? Brain over brawn? Abdullahad asked his new captain. No, I wanted to find out how you worked as a team. I wanted a leader to emerge. Not one of you managed to impress me. The only way to move this keg without cheating would have been as a team. Work as a team or die one by one. It is your choice on the battlefield. Strength does not just come from your muscles, but from your head and your heart. The true test of strength will come down to the decisions you make on the battlefield. When to run, when to hide, when to engage. Ahmed roamed over towards a barrel of metal training swords and began to pluck them out of the barrel. He walked over to half a dozen hanging pigs and started flinging the swords at the feet of his men. The swords were dull and rusted down to nubs of bent metal. Now, we will test your endurance. This is a pig, the animal closest in tone, texture, and smell to a Sasanian. And no, Kassar, this is not a test of your stomach. This is a test of endurance. What do you expect us to do with it exactly? Kassar asked. I want you to swing your sword at this pig until you mangle the carcass beyond recognition. I want you to swing your sword until it breaks in half. I want you to swing your sword until you chop this pig into two halves. Kassar swung at the pig with all his might. Each blow of his sword smashed the pig's bones into a pulverized dust. The sound of the strike echoed throughout the courtyard and beyond the walls of the palace. With every swing of the beleaguered blade, sweat flung across the courtyard like droplets of water spewing from a broken sprinkler. One by one, the recruits' relentless battering of the pigs dwindled down to a few exhausted, pattering slaps. Abdullahad took a moment of rest to examine his hands. One of the men huffed and puffed until he began to dry heave and cave over in exhaustion. Tired already? The boy picked up his head and asked, I don't see the point. What is your name? Yes, sir. Sir? Pick up your sword and keep swinging, yes, sir. That goes for the lot of you. Do you think the Sasanians will tire? Do you think they will give you a break? Do you think they will show you mercy? Swing or die? Not quite like a blacksmith hammer, eh? Ahmed said demandingly to his naive protege. Not quite, sir. Keep going like your lives depend on it. Pick up the slack. Kassar's mighty arm began to falter. He momentarily plunged the point of his sword into the ground. The gravel of the courtyard was fine as sand and as clumpy as clay. Kassar looked down at his feet as he collected his breath. His leather sandals were drenched in sweat, which produced more of a brownish hue that matched his skin tone. Ahmed lurked over to the young behemoth. His shadow dwarfed the young man from behind. As Kassar labored to reclaim his composure, he pleaded with the captain. I need a break, captain. A break? The captain asked politely while shaking his head. Ahmed bent a knee to meet Kassar at eye level. He patted him on the back and whispered into his enormous ear. Kassar's breathing noticeably hastened as the two men quietly conversed. Ahmed stood up and shouted, A break! The Sasanians will not be so kind.
The Sasanians will provide you with no such opportunities. The Sasanians will show you no mercy. Swing! Abdullahad picked his sword back up. The weight sunk his shoulders like the anchor of a yacht dredging the bottom of the sea. On this day, he would prove his worth. Giving up already, Kassar, Nasser asked his fellow soldier. Kassar flicked his sword away in anger, like a child throwing a temper tantrum on the playground. He stormed away from the pig and sat down next to the other exhausted soldiers. Nasser looked over to the remaining soldiers. Only three men were left swinging. And then there were just three. The infamous Abdullahad, Nasir, and who are you? My name is Assad, sir. And yes, Assad. The three men all lumbered over and started sucking down oxygen at an aggressive speed. Pools of sweat dampened the courtyard around the three men in large concentric circles. Sweat exuded off their skin like moisture wrung from a damp cloth. Nasser slowly blew out a breath, like the slow exhaust before a birthday wish. Overcome with thorough exhaustion, Nasser abandoned his grip on the sword and dropped to his knees. And then there were two. Who will win? Who will endure? Kassar shouted, I'd put my money on Abdullahad, the infamous Abdullahad. Assad looked back at Kassar and winked his left eye. Continue! The captain shouted at the top of his lungs. As the two men swung, the sun stooped over the courtyard of the palace. The other men formed a crescent half-circle around Abdullahad and Assad. The mangled corpses of the hung pigs dangled on the end of the ropes. Chunks of tattered pig flesh scattered around the feet of the two men. Abdullahad looked over at Assad in order to gauge his composure. Assad was breathing heavily, but seemed to have an endless supply of energy. There was a sense of determination in his eyes. It was in that moment Abdullahad realized he would not win this competition. He slowly withdrew his sword from the inner belly of the swine and backed away from the carcass of the pig. Looks like we have a winner! Abdullahad smirked in defeat for some reason. Assad kept striking the pig. The men looked at Assad with a plague of confusion. Assad, you can stop striking the pig. Assad, unfazed by the command of his captain, continued to strike the pig with a relentless fervor. Assad, the captain said while grabbing the dull training blade with his bare hand. Assad broke his trance and looked over at the captain. Let it go, son, Ahmed said to the exuberant soldier. Assad relinquished his sword and slightly bowed his head at the captain. They killed my family, he whispered under his breath. Assad fixated on the pig and tightened the grip of his hands. His fingernails dug into his flesh as he angrily balled his fist up. Ahmed Fahad placed the training sword in his sheath and grabbed the shoulder of Assad. He leaned in close and said, I know, son, I know. I can guarantee you one thing. Assad looked up at the captain as he said, That is a time for vengeance. This I can promise you. Save your energy for the Sasanians. The men scattered to various cliques among the recruits. The captain allowed for a brief respite as he made preparations for the next test. Minutes turned into hours, hours into an afternoon. The stomachs of the men growled eagerly as the time passed. Ahmed gathered a bundle of wooden swords and tossed them at the feet of the soldiers. Sparring is not fighting. Sparring is practice. Practice makes perfect, men. What does wooden sword fighting have to do with real battle? Abdullahad asked the captain. How many of you have killed? Why are we practicing with wooden swords? Repeat after me. Sweat saves blood. Blood saves lives. But brains save both. The chorus of soldiers shouted, Sweat saves blood. Blood saves lives. But brains save both. 
Say it again, louder, shout it to the heavens. Sweat saves blood, blood saves lives, but brains save both. Ahmed pumped his fist into Kassar's chest and said, We are practicing with wooden swords, so when the time comes, you do not hesitate to kill. I can guarantee you this much. The Sasanian on the other end of his spear will not hesitate. He will kill without remorse. He will kill without hesitation. He will leave your body for the crows and feel no way about it. Kassar scoffed and said, Me? Hesitate? Kassar paired off with Nasser and began to spar. Kassar swung widely and with terrible force. He missed high, he missed wide. Nasser ducked, rolled, and moved around Kassar with ease. Ahmed Fahad stepped behind Nasser and shoved him into range of Kassar. Nasser flinched as the distance closed and Kassar slammed him in the side with his sword. Nasser spun to the ground and flung his sword as he fell to the ground. If I hesitate, I die. Repeat after me. Commit it to memory. If I hesitate, I die, the group chanted. Good. Again. Abdullahad picked up Nasser's discarded training sword and squared off with Ahmed Fahad. Ahmed started laughing at the show of bravado from the tenderfoot. I hope you do not expect me to go easy on you, Abdullahad. I would not dream of it, he said while hoisting up his sword. Ahmad Fahad inspected his training sword and snapped it in half like a twig. There, now it is a fair fight. Maybe I will just use one hand as well. Abdullahad smirked and rushed headstrong into battle. Ahmad sidestepped the overzealous blacksmith and slapped him across the face with a shortened sword. The sword left a large red welt on the side of Abdul's left cheek. Rush in, get slaughtered. Let the Sasanians make the mistakes. We do not make mistakes. We are lions. Abdullahad spit out a goblet of blood and dropped to the ground. His sword still clenched firmly in the grasp of his hand. Again? Ahmed asked. Again, he replied to the captain. Abdullahad stood up to his feet, and the rest of the men began watching the sparring session. Five minutes of sparring turned into ten, and then another ten turned into an hour. The two men danced throughout the courtyard, like brawling siblings deadlocked in an endless duel. As the sunlight faded away into the later hours of the evening, the two men quivered with adrenaline and succumbed to exhaustion. Ahmed tucked his training sword into his armpit and bowed at his young apprentice. Abdullahad tossed the sword aside and nodded his head at the captain. After a few moments of catching his breath, Ahmed said, Now it is time to pick your weapon. Ahmed casually strolled over to a large covered trove of weapons. The battalion followed their captain, and each man began to peruse the assortment of weapons. Kassar shoved the onlookers out of the way and fixated himself on a large wooden war club. The war club was a solid piece of rounded red oak that reached nearly a meter in length. He snatched the leather-bound handle of the war club with a single hand. Even for the massive hand of Kassar, the girth of the club required two hands to properly wield. Kassar took the war club to the center of the courtyard and began to swing the club over his head. Nasser's eyes were caught by the glimmer of wavy daggers. Eleven daggers were tightly wrapped into an interwoven leather blade carrying case. He took both hands and detached the carrying case from the treasure trove of weapons. The wavy daggers jingled as they moved. He tightly secured the case around his waistline and began to examine the daggers in further detail. One by one he pulled out the daggers, feeling the weight and spinning the blades. Asad sputtered an all-too-familiar weapon from his village. He walked up and grabbed a curved bow from the weapon's inventory. He balanced the bow and began to rapidly but gently pull the string. The rest of the battalion armed themselves with various weaponry. Do you know how to use that? 
Asad looked over at the captain and confidently smiled. I am a hunter, sir. That doesn't answer my question. Do you know how to use that? Would you like to find out? That's the spirit, Ahmed said while grabbing another bow from the inventory. Asad notched an arrow and easily shot one of the unlit lanterns hanging in the courtyard. The lantern was about twenty or so feet in the air and slowly wafting in the cool breeze. Good shot, but can you do it when it counts? Under pressure? When it comes down to life or death? When the single shot of an arrow can mean the difference between a brethren dying or living? I've never come home empty-handed. Ahmed scoffed and shouted, Kassar, grab a couple of apples from the bushel over there, and don't eat them. Kassar retrieved two fully ripened apples from the barrel and held them in his hands with a somewhat confused look on his face. Put one on your head. Kassar cautiously obliged at the order. The apple rested firmly on the giant head of Kassar. Now the question is, hunter, can you do it when it matters? He asked Asad. Asad looked over at his nervous comrade and confidently nodded his head. Don't move, Kassar, he said while notching another arrow. Asad slowly drew his arrow and pulled his bowstring. Asad squinted his left eye to narrow his field of vision. Kassar stretched open his eyelids, completely exposing the whites of his eyes. Sweat slowly dripped down his forehead, like the slow drip of a broken faucet. Kassar's immense lungs filled with dry air, hulking his chest as big as a blowfish. Ahmed snuck up behind Asad and loudly clapped his hands behind his ear. His concentration broke and the arrow whirled past Kassar's head, missing his ear by several inches. To Kassar's praise, he did not flinch a single muscle. Hunting is hunting. It is not warfare. I was distracted, Asad responded bitterly to his captain. And you expect the Sasanians to do what? Do you expect them to walk on eggshells? Should they prance around wearing velvet slippers? Notch another arrow and get to work, or pick up a sword. Asad quickly notched another arrow and refocused his aim on the apple. He squinted his left eye and started tracking his breathing. As he took in the dry air of the courtyard, his other senses became heightened. His field of view narrowed, focusing out everything except the apple. Kassar was standing about twenty feet away from the archer, sweating like a pig. Asad inhaled a deep breath, and at the top of the breath, held it. As he slowly exhaled the breath, he effortlessly released the arrow from his grip. The arrow whirled across the courtyard. In a flash, the arrow struck through the apple, propelling it to the ground. Kassar's face turned completely pale, and he began furiously rummaging around on his head. To his surprise, there was no arrow. To his surprise, there was no apple. To his surprise, Asad pulled it off. Ahmed walked over to the archer and patted him on the shoulder. Not bad, hunter, not bad at all, he said while walking back to the group. Nasser began rearranging the daggers into various slots on his uniform. He spun the daggers in his hands and effortlessly packed them away. Close quarters combat? I prefer short blades for my long arms. Word of advice, Nasser. Never stick a tall man with a short blade. You'll only anger him or get yourself killed in the process. Ahmed motioned Nasser to attack him. Nasser hesitated for a moment, and Ahmed slapped him in the face. Nasser pulled one of the daggers from his torso holster and lunged at Ahmed. Ahmed sidestepped the young man and parried the dagger with his wooden training sword. You'll need to do better than that if you expect to best the Sasanian. Nasser advanced with the daggers, and Ahmed thrust his training sword into the navel of his belly. The young villager caved over as he attempted to gasp for oxygen. The fleeting breaths failed to recover the young man, like a fish out of water, slowly gasping for air. 
You'll need to do better than that. Nasser pulled one of the daggers from his boot and recklessly flung it at the captain. The dagger spun awkwardly at the captain, swiftly spinning tip over heel. Ahmed pivoted on the balls of his heel and swung his training sword at the dagger. The dagger shot out of the courtyard and tumbled to the ground outside of the palace. Not bad, Nasser. Desperate, but not bad, he said while sheathing his sword and extending his hand to Nasser. Nasser obliged and the captain pulled him up to his feet. He dusted off the young man as he stood up. Ahmed bowed at the battalion of men and said, Rest up tonight, because tomorrow we go to war. This battalion will lead the way. The Sasanians will regret the day they decided to step foot on our land. That I can promise you, men. On the next morning, the men awoke to the call of their captain. They ate heartily, as if it was their final meal, but quickly, as if it were an afternoon snack. The men mounted their camels and rode to the nearest village. An hour passed, and then another. Before the men realized it, half the day passed by, and they had arrived at a village. A long whistle of the wind roared through the valley and induced a sense of ire among the battalion. The nearest village was just on the other side of the river. From the looks of the village, smoke plumed from the fireplaces and animals wandered about. From the distance of the hilltop overlooking the river, no person could be seen. Nasser, Asad, go scout the village. The rest of you, stay vigilant. The two men dismounted their respective camels and embarked towards the village. They followed the tree line down the hilltop and began traversing the riverbed behind the village. As the men crossed the river, the battalion inched closer and closer to the village. Each man began to dismount and ready their arms. In the distance, Nasser and Assad climbed one of the huts and started waving at the battalion. The battalion of fifty men set down the hilltop towards the village, like the long march of ants on an anthill. The village looks abandoned from the looks of it, sir. Abandoned, the captain replied. Not a soul in sight, sir, Nasser said to his captain. Thump, thump, thump. As the distant thumping of Sasanian war drums pounded, the newly formed battalion reactively rushed down the hill towards the presumed safety of the village. Ahmed froze on his camel as his soldiers broke rank, like the scattering of a gaggle of geese suddenly fleeing a watering hole. It's a trap. Thump, thump, thump. The frequency of the thumping incrementally hastened, and the tremble of the thumping boosted. Ahmad! I walked us right into a trap. Ahmad! Snap out of it, sir. Your men need you, Abdullah had said while slapping his captain across the cheek. The slap instantly woke Ahmad from his trance. He shook his head and rode towards the center of the vacant village. He dismounted his camel and yelled, Form up on me! The battalion of men loosely formed a circle around the courageous captain. The huts of the village formed a disjointed perimeter around the men. The mound swelled with Sasanians. From every side they were completely surrounded by the enemy. The front line of the battalion swayed side by side, like a piece of driftwood floating in the high tide. The Sasanians hoisted large black and yellow war banners as they marched down to the village. The captain gulped and placed his hand on the hilt of his sword. Now is not the time for glorious speeches. Now is not the time for rousing words of wisdom. Now is not the time to cower behind his men. Ahmed pushed past the rows of his nervous countrymen, hoisted up his sword, and shouted, Even in death we may live forever! In a reflexive unison, the dozens of men under his command simultaneously hoisted their weapons toward the sky and shouted in chorus, Even in death we may live forever! Thump. 
Historians would write poems of valor on this day. The men fought well. The men fought to no avail. The men fought to the very end. In the skirmish, Ahmed Abdullahad, Kassar, Nasir, and Asad suffered numerous abrasions, cuts, and bruises. The blubbery blood of the battalion soaked the ground. The blood of the battalion drenched the skin of the five men. Somehow, in all of the confusion, the blood lathered the men like a camouflage. The drunken Sasanian army passed each man without so much as a hint of circumspection. The five men lay tattered and scattered among the corpses of the fallen Afghan battalion. Ahmed made slight gestures to each man. Instinctively, they froze in place. As the night fell upon the village, the Sasanians became increasingly drunk. Ahmed gripped onto his sword with a ferocious intensity. The Sasanians crookedly stumbled around the village, completely unaware of the looming threat. They discarded any semblance of formality, any notion of tactical presence, and most importantly, each man began to disarm. Throughout the night, Ahmed crawled on his back, closer and closer to his comrades. He moved one inch at a time. He moved in the shadows. He moved under the bodies of his fallen comrades. Abdullahad. Abdullahad did not so much as flinch, calcified by the stench of his fallen comrades. He was petrified by the abeyance of the battle to come. Abdul, he pleaded with his comrade. Abdullahad looked over to his unflappable captain. Ahmed's face was lathered with a crimson blood and body smeared with bile. When they fall asleep, we launch our attack. Abdullahad, Nasir, Asad, and Kassar all looked over at their captain and nodded in solidarity. No training in the world could have prepared the tenderfoot soldiers for this moment. Ahmad was all too aware of the odds, but confident in his men nonetheless. On this day, he would earn his self-proclaimed title of the famous Ahmad Fahad. Time marched on as slow as embers fading from the dwindling logs on the campfire. The Sasanians drank booze like it was water. As the Sasanians ran dry of libations, the night sky drowned the village in total darkness. Ahmed slowly unsheathed his sword and placed it across his chest. He cautiously pivoted his head and nodded to the rest of the men. Each man drew the nearest weapon and prepared for some payback. As the fire drew down at the campfire, the Sasanians started to urinate into the flames. Ahmed pushed off the corpses of his fallen comrades and daringly dashed towards the campfire. The campfire was surrounded by a baker's dozen of battle-hardened Sasanians, some of them drunk, some of them sleeping, some of them dancing around the fire. The other four men hopped up, weapons drawn, and followed their captain into certain death. Each man leaped into the fray and began slashing up the Sasanians. The Sasanians had been shouting and hollering all night, but this was a different kind of screaming. These were the screams of panic. These were the screams of terror. One of the Sasanians woke from his drunk stupor and sprinted towards the makeshift barracks. Kassar took his sword and flung it at the Sasanian. The sword flung with such force it managed to split the Sasanian clean in half. The men were ruthlessly efficient and as quiet as Akkadian assassins. The men tenderly crept into the barracks of sleeping Sasanians. One by one, they silently avenged their comrades in arms, down to the very last man. After cutting down the entire battalion of Sasanians, all of the men returned to the campfire and collapsed to a knee. Each man barely clung on to life. Even Kassar used his sword as an old man used a cane. In the corner of his eye, Nasir caught a wavy piece of leather flapping in the wind. On one of the Sasanian corpses, a mangled leather map was dangling from his pocket. Nasser bent down and snatched the map out of the Sasanian's pocket. 
The map covered the better part of the borders of Afghanistan. Elongated X's marked the maps, crossing out various villages that Sasanians undoubtedly sacked. Nasser spit on the corpse of the Sasanian in disgust and slammed the map into the chestplate of Kassar. Kassar held the map in between his palm and the armor of his chestplate. He threw his sword into the sand and began to examine the tarnished map. Ahmad, he yelled to his captain while waving him over. Kassar dragged his forearm across his mouth, wiping away the Sasanian blood from his chiseled chin. He handed over the map to his captain for further inspection. After a few seconds of catching his breath, he walked around the village to find his war club. Ahmed simultaneously sheathed his sword and caught the map with his outstretched hand. Ahmed began to walk around in small concentric circles and outlined the details on the map. He stopped dead in his tracks. Ahmed's eyebrows spontaneously scrunched. Ahmed's nostrils flared. Ahmed's eyes glazed over as he read the map. They have found the goat trail. They could walk right up to the doorsteps of the palace. We need to inform the king at once. The men rode fast. The men rode furious. The men rode until the camels could ride no more. Meters turned into miles, and miles turned into hours. As the men passed Abdullahad's village at the bottom of the valley, the camels collapsed from exhaustion, hurling the men in every direction. The men climbed the mound of the valley and sprinted up the path to the palace. As the men made their ascent, nightfall had turned into daybreak. Who goes there? Ahmed completely abandoned his respect for authority and plunged his hands firmly onto the doors of the palace gate. Kassar and Ahmed shoved the doors open, and the men stormed into the palace. The guardsmen gripped onto their swords, and Kassar walloped the largest guard with his war club. The other guardsmen slowly withdrew any hostilities and formality as the five lions entered the throne room. We have seen their kind before, the king proclaimed while clutching onto a goblet of wine. My king, they know nothing, nothing but terror. The Sasanians are on a warpath to this very palace, Ahmed shouted to the room of bureaucrats and sycophants. Sire, if I may. Ah, yes, Abdullahad. Please, speak plainly, blacksmith. Abdullahad took a deep breath and said, The Sasanians have plagued this land for too long. If the Sasanians yearn for war, we shall deliver them war. On our terms, not on their terms. Abdullahad tossed the map onto the ground in front of the king. One of the king's closest confidants scurried over to the map and snatched it off the ground. He began to inspect the map. His face quickly turned pale as he realized the contents of the map. He began to fervently whisper into the ear of the king. The king waved him off, and he descended the throne. Where, where is the rest of your battalion? Ahmed gulped and raised his chin up in the air. He licked the tips of his lips with a slow, exacting tongue lashing. His lips were cracked with scraggy abrasions from the dry heat of the desert and tasted of warm salt water. They died for the kingdom of Afghanistan. They died for their country. They died for you, Ahmed shouted. The king walked down from his perch and began to inspect the battle-hardened soldiers standing in front of him, the sobering reality of the war finally piercing his thick skull. Each of you men have met the Sasanians in battle. Each of you men have bested them in battle. Each of you men have outsmarted them in battle. On our terms, yes. The Sasanians may be large in numbers. This is not their land. This is not their home. The topography is as familiar to us as the marks on the top of our hands. From birth you men have lived off the fat of the land, breathed the air and faced the elements. We will draw them into the mouth of the Panjshir Valley and crush them like pebbles under the wheels of a carriage. Yes, they are strong. 
Yes, they are fast. They are also sloppy. There we will make our stand among the cover of forest, choking them into the mouth of the valley. Their number is an open combat we cannot defeat. If we can funnel them into the mouth of the valley, we can stop them once and for all. The king snapped his fingers, and his entire detachment of royal guards sprang to the front of the room. They lined up in a long row with their chests puffed out, like a bunch of pufferfish covered in leather armor. My personal guard will fight alongside of you. Ahmed started rocking his head back and forth, like the slow rhythm of a baby's cradle. Have any of these men seen battle? The king's chest began to expand like the pregnant belly of an expecting mother. I believe what he meant, sire, was that in case they make it past the five of us, your royal guardsmen should defend the palace. True lions. Yes, why send two hundred sheep when I could send five lions? If not manpower, what other provisions can I provide you? Ahmed looked over at Kassar and pointed to the curtains with a quick nod of the head. Kassar smiled and returned a nod in acknowledgement to his captain. Ahmed placed his hands firmly behind the swell of his back and said, Your Majesty, we could use some banners. A small donation to the war effort indeed. Kassar walked over to the curtains. The massive warrior's feet stomped across the throne room to the royal tapestries. He examined the cloth and began to rip the drapes down from the ceiling. Sunlight shot into the throne room for the first time in eons. The beams of the sunlight danced around the room like a drunken ballerina spinning around a stage after a recital. The five lions all stared out into the basking glow of the face. Act 4. Thump, thump, thump. As the five men approached the mouth of the valley, the ferocity of the drumming echoed throughout the endless mounds. The roaring of the drums bounced off the granite and bombarded the eardrums of the five men. As the beat of the drums grew closer, the men became increasingly rambunctious. How far? Abdullah had asked while refreshing some of his variegated bandages. Ahmed sighed and said, They are just over the mound. I'd say less than a mile. Good. I was starting to get bored, Kassar said while gently patting his camel on the nose. The camel instinctively squirmed as the large hand mildly clobbered the nose of the camel. The men fulminated with laughter at their companion's unbashful bravado. Kassar, make sure to leave some for the rest of us, Nasser said while readying his armaments. Thump, thump, thump. There will be plenty of Sasanians for us to slay. For this I promise you, men. Ready your arms, Ahmed shouted to his squadron. Abdullahad constricted his blacksmith hammer as hard as a python latching onto a gazelle. The salty air of the valley marinated his lips. The sun radiated from directly over the hilltop. Sweat lethargically dripped down his face. Large yellow circles formed under his armpits, like the rows of rings on a tree trunk. Crows flew over the hilltop, making a large concentric meridian, teeming with excitement and anticipating the feast to come. Thump. 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 Kassar detached his war club from the camel and began to swing it in elongated concentric circles around his head. Nasser pulled back two of his eleven wavy Chris daggers. Abdullahad clasped onto his blacksmith hammer. Ahmed Fahad unsheathed his curvy sword. Asad pulled back his bow and arrow. Ahmed walked over to each man and thoroughly inspected their armor. He inspected the armor as closely as a mother hemming a wedding dress. Is this the end? Ahmed scoffed and said, Death comes for us all. Life is only a meridian we travel, like the goat up a mountain trail. We walk from the bottom of the trail with hopes of reaching the top. We walk up the trail, but for how long we do not know. No matter how fast we walk, 
no matter how careful we walk. In the end, it doesn't matter. The path chooses us. We do not choose the path. The path chooses when our journey comes to an end. The men stoically glanced at their wise captain, the famous Ahmed Fahad. Ahmed took a moment to rejoice in the simplicity of the valley. Nasser's long wavy hair wafted in the wind as a strong gust blew through the valley. Ahmed bent down and purged a bundle of crabgrass from the ground. He raised up his hand and gently released the blades of grass. The razor-sharp grass was effortlessly carried away by the gust of wind. We have the wind to our backs, Ahmed shouted to his men. Someone must be looking out for us, Asad said. How fortuitous, Abdullah had said, while rubbing the soil of the valley in between his hands. Rather auspicious, if you ask me, Nasser said. Ahmed smiled and said, Destiny has brought us together to this one moment in time. Our fates have been intertwined. Facing down the barbarian horde of over two hundred bloodthirsty Sassanians, we may be outnumbered, but I'd take five Afghans over two hundred Sassanians any day of the week and twice on Sunday. When they approach the riverbed, I want you to hurl your spears high into the air. Then we charge. Charge? You want to charge? That's your plan? Abdullah had asked his captain. Thump. 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 Ahmad Fahad placed his hand behind his back and bathed his face in the warm embrace of the Afghan sunlight. He stretched his arms to the side and perched his palms onto the hilt of his sword. If they see a smaller force charging at them, the wings might break rank and scatter. The Sasanians will attempt to surround us, but the valley will prevent any such formation. We charge, then fight backing up into the valley. The narrow paths, the wind, and the rocky footing will be our advantage. Watch my back, watch each other, and God will watch over us all. On this day, our names will live forever. It sounds crazy enough to work, Kassar said, holding back his stomach as he laughed out loud. It can be done if God wills it, Nasser said to his comrades with an optimistic tone of voice. Asad stroked his beard and said, on this day, we do the impossible. Why not? Ahmed Fahad, the famous, Abdullah had said while clutching his hammer. Thump, thump, thump. The Sasanians marched over the mound of the valley in a tight formation. They hymned a chant as they marched and pounded on those dreaded war drums. Those same war drums that haunted the dreams of Abdullah had. One row of Sasanians turned into three. Three turned into ten. Hoist our banners high, boys! Ahmed shouted to his men. Kassar unraveled the makeshift banners and began to hoist them on long wooden spikes. Kassar walked over to each man and shoved the spike into their hands. One by one, the men hoisted their banners and slammed them into the mushy soil of the Panjshir Valley. The tattered black and crimson flags blew against the backs of the men, towards the direction of the oncoming Sasanian horde. Are you really famous? Abdullah had asked his captain. Ahmed scoffed gleefully and said, We are about to find out, Abdullah had. We are about to find out. The Sasanians swelled in numbers as they approached the mouth of the valley. The valley was littered with natural impediments. Hundreds of jagged boulders were scattered around the valley. Rows of arborous species lined both sides of the valley. A riverbed fissured the valley into two distinct halves. One half of the valley was rocky. The other half of the valley had developed into a marshland. Thump, thump, thump. Maybe they'll surrender, Nasser joked. Kassar grabbed his swollen stomach and bellowed over in laughter. His laugh carinated the belly of the valley, bouncing from one end to the other like the roar of a yodel. 
A hazy mist of salty air dampened the valley and muffled the sharpness of the laughter that blended with the gusts of wind. Some day I will tell my grandkids the story. When they reach the riverbed, we charge, Ahmed said while pulling out his sword. As the Sasanians drew closer, the thumping magnified. Ahmed raised his sword to the sky and screamed, Charge! The five men stormed down the trail, shrieking blood-curdling screams. The screams echoed throughout the valley like the wailing of banshees roaring out of the abyss. The Sasanians stubbornly slowed their descent on the mound. They approached the muddied ground of the riverbed with some noticeable trepidation for the terrain. The sound of the thumping was overwhelmed by the screams of the five men. The Sasanians fettered out into disjointed battle lines. The muddied riverbed pushed the Sasanian lines into more of a checkered pattern than a proper military formation. The battle lines moved lazily throughout the riverbed as the men approached from the other side of the valley. The five lions quickly closed the gap and leaped at the Sasanians before they could develop a properly arranged formation. Kassar leaped up first with his war club in both hands and slammed it down onto the nearest Sasanian. The Sasanian squandered any goodwill he had on that day by foolishly raising up his sword to block the war club. Kassar came down on the Sasanian and smashed the man's sword straight through his face. In the first volley, he split the man's head into two pieces, like a knife through melted butter. The Sasanian's body spasmed in place for a moment and fell to the ground with a loud thud. Blood squirted from the man's brainstem and gushed all over the front line of the Sasanians. Kassar swung his war club wildly. He whirled around the devastation of a tornado. He pulverized the shields of the Sasanian front line, like the clobbering destruction of a wrecking ball against concrete. Esad swiftly notched three arrows to his bowstring and popped up in the air, shooting a volley into the back lines of the Sasanians. The Sasanians raised up their shields in a feeble attempt to block the oncoming strafe. The commander of the Sasanians rolled out of the way, successfully dodging one of the arrows, while one hit him in the left shoulder. The other stray arrow bounced off a shield and struck one of the Sasanians in the hamstring, instantly dropping the man to the ground. He riled in pain as he attempted to pull the arrow out. The man dropped his shield, giving Esad just enough time to notch his bow with another arrow. Esad effortlessly drew back on the bow and unleashed a single arrow into the man's forehead. He smiled and ran off laterally down the riverbed to find some cover. Ahmed and Abdullahad rushed into the center of the lines and clashed with the Sasanians. Some of the men instinctively scattered from their formation. The center began to buckle as Abdullahad swung his blacksmith hammer in wild swirling loops. Ahmed sliced up the front line of Sasanians, fighting three at a time. He leaped heroically back and forth as he jousted the Sasanians. He fainted flawlessly. He dodged attacks from every angle. He parried attacks one and two at a time. One of the Sasanians got lucky and was able to slice Ahmed's forearm just above the wrist. Abdul and Ahmad fought back to back, encircled by a dozen bloodthirsty Sasanians. They rushed in one by one, and the two men repelled the attacks with ease. Abdullahad momentarily lost his footing and slipped into the muddied ground of the riverbed. Two of the Sasanians jumped in to strike Abdul from behind. Abdul raised his arms to block the oncoming Sasanian swords. Whoosh! Out of nowhere, two knives flew in and struck each Sasanian in the heart. Their large bodies fell backwards onto the riverbed and splashed water across the battlefield. Nasser rushed in and slid over to his comrade in arms. In one swooping motion, he slid across the ground and plucked Abdul back to his feet. As Nasser popped up, 
he simultaneously pulled two daggers tucked into the back of his belt and spun around, throwing them in opposite directions. Both daggers hit a charging Sasanian and knocked them to the ground. Nasta reached down and snagged two of the daggers, one from each boot. As he stood up, a line of Sasanians replenished in front of the three men. Nasser, Abdullahad, and Ahmed stood down fifteen fresh Sasanians. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Three more arrows pelted the Sasanian lines, but only two of the arrows fired true and hit their intended targets. Asad leapt heroically into the fray with his comrades. The four men smiled at each other as they calmly walked toward the Sasanians and said simultaneously, Even in death, we may live forever. As the men approached the front line of Sasanians, a large circular shadow dwarfed the men. They looked back up. Kassad had flung a massive boulder at the Sasanians. The boulder smashed through the front line and scattered the demoralized Sasanians. Can't let you hug up all the glory, Kassar said while screaming at the top of his lungs. Kassar smiled down on his fellow Afghans. As he stepped forward, a spear hit him in the side. Kassar fell to his knees and turned his head towards the Sasanian spear chucker. Kassar! Nasser shouted to his injured comrade. The Sasanian instantly regretted his decision to step onto the field of battle as Kassar's eyes glazed over with a blood rage. He snapped the spear like a twig and tossed it to the ground. Kassar took his war club and charged at the man. The Sasanian slipped and fell to the ground as he attempted to retreat into the forest. Kassar took his war club and flogged the young Sasanian warrior to death. As he slammed his war club down on the men, Kassar's face began to turn pale. He looked down at his wound. It was far worse than he initially thought. After pummeling the Sasanian into a pulverized mush, he kneeled over from exhaustion. Nasser broke off from his brethren and jolted towards his injured comrade. As Nasser ran to assist his comrade in arms, he took an arrow to the shoulder. The arrow lodged in between his deltoid and bicep. Blood oozed out of his shoulder and down his side. Nasser was running on pure adrenaline. It barely fazed him as he ran. Assad looked over to the group of archers lobbing arrows at Nasser and Kassar. He notched his bow and slowly drew back on the bow. His arm quivered as he steadied his aim. Even in death, we may live forever, Asad said while steadily aiming his bow. He released a string of his bow and the arrow floated over the lines of the Sasanians, striking one of the other archers in the face. Asad lowered his bow and took a deep breath. One of the Sasanians snuck behind the men, and slashed Asad in the back with a single silent strike. He flung his bow into the air and dropped to the ground. Abdullahad turned his head to the sound of Asad screaming. He took his blacksmith hammer and wound it up behind him. He tossed the hammer at the Sasanian with all of his might. The force of the hammer crushed the facial bones of the Sasanian and snapped his head back, completely dislodging it from his spine. The man was dead, but his body did not yet realize it. His body quaked and fell to the ground, like a decapitated zombie. Abdullahad spun around and plucked his hammer from the Sasanian's skull. How bad is it? Be still, brother, he said while examining his comrade. As Abdullahad examined Asad's back, another scream lashed out from the front lines. Ahmad was struck with two spears, one from the left and one from the right. He raised up his sword and slashed down the two Sasanians holding each of the spears. Nasser tossed the last of his knives and ran over to his mortally wounded captain. The Sasanians had almost scattered and taken cover behind their archers. Nasser snatched up Ahmad and stumbled back to Abdullahad. Are you really famous? Asad asked his captain while coughing up blood. 
The blackened blood drenched the jaw of the Afghani archer. We are all famous on this day. On this day our names shall live forever, he said while patting Esad on the shoulder. Blood rained from the ears of the captain and drooled from his eyelids. A volley of arrows launched at the men. In an instant, Ahmed looked up at the incoming arrows and began to scan his men. He looked down at Abdullahad and with his last ounce of strength shoved him out of the way. The arrows, however, tattooed the men like chicken pox. Asad laid on the ground, completely motionless. Nasser took three arrows to his lower torso and reverse army crawled over to Ahmad. Even in death, we may live forever, Nasser said while reaching out to his captain. He extended his hand to Ahmad, only for it to go completely limp. Six lightly armored Sasanians witnessed the successful barrage of arrows and charged at the men with a renewed vigor. Ahmed rose up to his feet, with at least six gushing wounds on his body. He could barely bring his sword up to his waist. His legs wobbled uncontrollably as he prepared to put up his final fight. As the Sasanians came barreling down on the men, a large shadow covered the Sasanians from the side. Kassar had rose up from the grave like a zombie and charged the men with two battle axes. He swung like a whirlwind, furiously chopping down the Sasanians. In the process, the archers had tattooed his back with a dozen arrows. Kassar dropped the axes and fell face first into the ground. Abdullah had crawled over to defend his captain. His legs wobbled, scathed and beaten by the battle. Abdullahad looked at his captain and said, If this is our destiny, then we have lived a good life. It was an honor. Ahmed fell to one knee and plunged the tip of his sword in the ground, like an old man using a crutch to stand. Abdullahad latched onto his captain and propped him upright. His chest caved over like a hunchback. If we die, we shall die on our feet. You fought well today, Abdullahad. You fought like a true Afghan. Your father would be proud. I had an excellent instructor. The two wounded men stood side by side as another swarm of Sasanians mounted an offensive. Abdullahad held up his blacksmith hammer at the sky and started chanting an ancient hymn. As the Sasanians approached, the sweat from his hand began to drip down onto his forehead. The Sasanians lowered their advance, like the snow leopard stalking an unsuspecting elk. A mysterious treble quaked the ground, like the aftershock of an earthquake. Abdullahad looked over his shoulder to the southern trail. A swarm of camels was riding down from the palace at breakneck speed. The camels rode past the two men with a furious intensity. The palace guard, led by the king of Afghanistan, cut down the remaining Sasanians with ignoble brutality. The eager novices shouted and hollered as they swept up the rest of the Sasanian forces. The king swung his sword with gleeful admiration for the blood sport, splashing Sasanian blood with every swipe. Dust swarmed around the two men, acting as a natural cover from the Sasanian archers. The king shouted at the guardsmen to press the attack against the fleeing Sasanians. After consuming enough spectacle for a lifetime, the king rode his camel over to Abdullahad and his wounded captain. He leapt down from his camel and began to wipe the blood from his blade. He sheathed his sword and said, What kind of king would I be if I was unwilling to defend my own kingdom? <laughs>